Welcome to the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region Speaker Series Session. We will begin the program momentarily. Welcome everyone. Today's session is being recorded and you are in listen only mode. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, feel free to submit them in the chat box. Our speakers will try to get to as many of them during our Q&A session towards the end of the program. With that, please welcome Regional CEO Hannah Malik. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Hanna Malik, and I have the pleasure of serving as the regional CEO for the Northern California Coastal Region. I've been with the Red Cross for over 10 years, serving on both the West Coast and the East Coast. And I have the, the privilege of serving in this region with 7,000 volunteers and 75 employees that work around the clock to serve our community. And that's 10 million, over 10 million residents in the 15 counties within our region. The thing that has been consistent for me, both on the West Coast and the East Coast, is the dedication of our donors, our volunteers, and our staff that advance our mission. Today, our speakers are gonna dive deeper into the importance of diversifying our blood supply and the Red Cross Sickle Cell Initiative. Before they do, I thought I'd give a high-level overview of our different lines of service and how they relate to blood services. First is our disaster services one of the services that we're most well known for. With the monumental amounts of rain that we saw here in California in the last month and a half, we were working around the clock to serve the community. We had floods, landslides, fallen trees, and sunken roads. And as of February 14th, nearly 800 Red Crossers from all 50 states came to help us and help the community. We helped provide food comfort and hope during people's darkest hours. With our partners, we were able to open up 82 shelters, which is not a small feat. We had over 9,000 residents stay in our shelters and served more than 63,000 meals. And it's times like that where we see our community step up to support each other. As a result of the storms, there were canceled blood drives and donors that weren't able to make it out to, to their commitment of blood appointments. Just another important reason for folks to sign up to make to donate blood and to honor those those appointments. Our next service is our training service. We have a rich history of having people be prepared for life saving skills like first aid, CPR, AED, swim classes, lifeguarding classes, babysitting classes. We have a program called Be Red Cross Ready, which teaches the basics of emergency preparedness in using three simple steps. Get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. It combines our elements of training services and disaster services. Next is our international services, where we partner with 180 other Red Cross and Red Crescent societies through emergency health services, external disaster relief, strengthening leadership, financial management, volunteer network, and support the global movement of the, of the Red Cross. When disasters strike, the Red Cross is there. We help reconnect families separated by crisis, helping rebuild communities devastated by international disasters as well. With the devastating 7.4 earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria on February 6th, set, following many aftershocks, that hit Turkey and Syria. We have been on the ground working around the clock to help with medical aid, psychological support, warm food and beverages. And the call for blood donations has been heightened due to the number of injuries. The Red Cross is in direct communication with the International Federation to help support the response and the immediate needs. 
Our service to the armed forces is responsible for providing various humanitarian services and resources to over 1 million active duty personnel and 1 million members of the National Guard and Reserves. There are services from across the United States and in military installations across the world. For example, it's been one year since the withdrawal of the US troops from Afghanistan and the mass exodus of refugees. And as the crisis unfolded, the American Red Cross was there to support the needs of the most vulnerable. And lastly, our important topic for the day is blood services. As the largest single supplier of the nation's blood supply, we represent about 40% and support over 3,000 different hospitals, transfusion centers, and medical facilities every single day. We're able to collect 6.5 million blood and blood products annually, thanks to our generous blood donors who roll up their sleeve, give time to help us save lives. Just like my brother, I'm very passionate about this service because my older brother, Charlie, was diagnosed with leukemia ALL at the age of eight, and it was Red Crossers and, and donors that helped save his life. Happy to say he's doing well and healthy today, but that wouldn't be the case if it wasn't for the Red Cross. I'm committed as a platelet donor. I'm wearing my cancer kicker shirt today um, and, and giving platelets just to pay it forward uh, on behalf of my, my brother and my family. Today we're going to talk about um, you know, the, the importance of, of blood and there's lots of opportunities within our region. We've got multiple fixed sites and mobile blood drives. Happy to say we celebrated the one year anniversary of our San Francisco fixed site in August of, of last year and it gives the opportunity for the community to donate blood in San Francisco six days a week and helps us diversify our blood supply. We also just opened up a new donor center in Oakland in the Rockridge area last month, and that one is also going strong. Over the course of 140 years, the Red Cross continues to show its resilience to serve communities locally, nationally, and internationally, and the need for Red Cross services only continue to grow. I'm proud to play a part of the, of the team, and I'm really thankful for our partners, our donors, and our volunteers who are on this call and help us support our mission, so thank you. I want to transition to Justin, our Regional Donor Services Executive for Northern California. He has been at the Red Cross for over 16 years and is also a platelet donor, donating over 161 units of blood product. I'll turn it over to Justin to share more about the great work our Biomed team is doing in Northern California. Thank you, Hanna, and thank you for providing that Red Cross overview and update. Throughout American Red Cross history, notable African Americans paved the way in our organization for future generations who came after them. During Black History Month, we're honoring men and women whose contributions were essential to our humanitarian mission. This includes Frederick Douglass, prominent abolitionist and author, became friends with the founder of the Red Cross, Clara Barton, shortly after the Civil War. He offered her advice and support as she tried to get the organization established in the US. Douglas's name is on the appeal for funds after the 1882 Mississippi floods, and he would eventually sign the Articles of Incorporation for the American Red Cross in his capacity as Register of Deeds for the District of Columbia. Frances Reed Elliott Davis brought her passion for nursing to the Red Cross, becoming its very first African-American nurse and provided medical care for the families of service members during World War I in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In the 1940s, Davis established a childcare facility that caught the attention of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who helped plan for and fund the center. An advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, as the Director of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration and the first African-American woman to head a federal agency, Mary McLeod Bethune was integral in discussing and increasing African-American representation within the Red Cross. From staff in overseas clubs and enrollment of nurses to those serving on committees and staff departments, both locally and nationally, and so much more. The iconic Red Cross bloodmobiles were the brainchild of Dr. Charles Drew. During World War II, England was facing possible invasion and officials realized massive quantities of blood would be needed for both the military and the civilians. The US Armed Forces asked the Red Cross to create and operate a national blood donor program to collect blood for shipment to the British Isles. 
Dr. Drew was already an authority in this field when he was appointed director of the first Red Cross blood bank in 1941. He was outspoken against unscientific and racially discriminatory practices in blood collection, and he was dedicated to blazing a trail for African Americans pursuing a medical education. Most Americans, possibly, do not know who he is, but his work, his innovation, his smarts, his commitment has saved millions of lives. And truly, it's because of the work of Dr. Drew that Dr. Drew started that today the Red Cross runs more blood drives and provides 40% of the nation's blood supply. These are stories of trailblazers from our past who made significant contributions to our country and to the American Red Cross. Without them, our humanitarian mission in providing life-saving blood, critical aid to families impacted by disasters, and support to military members, veterans, and their families would not be possible. As Hannah just shared with us, blood services is impacted by all of our Red Cross lines of service. Our biomed work is a massive honor and it's a responsibility as every two seconds someone in the U.S. needs blood or blood products like plasma. The Red Cross and other blood providers ensure there is sufficient blood for maternity wards, accident victims, leukemia, or other cancer patients, and for people with sickle cell disease who need regular transfusions. Biomedical services are the largest program area at the Red Cross. You can't make blood. It's the selfless donations by your neighbors, family, friends across the country who help provide this life-saving resources to people they've never even met. Donating blood truly is the gift of life. The need and use of blood follows an important route, arm to arm, from donor to patient. The Red Cross collects blood with the support of our blood donors and Red Cross teams. We then test, store, and transport blood to deliver the bags across the country where and when it is needed. Though people generously donate their blood and blood products freely, the work by the Red Cross to get this blood arm to arm to those folks who need the blood requires investment, and we ask for donations toward our blood services work on a cost recovery basis. Financial donors to our biomedical services program help us pay for the staff, the phlebotomists, the nurses, the technicians, equipment, storage, testing, delivery, and more. To shed some light on how many people give blood or platelets, approximately 3% of people in the US give blood. And for those of you wondering how things may have changed through this COVID pandemic, Pre-COVID, we needed to collect about 13,000 blood donations a day to meet patients' needs. Since COVID, that need hasn't changed. The month leading up to the pandemic, the Red Cross had only six units of type O blood available for every 100,000 people, but more than twice that is needed each and every day. The Red Cross experienced a 10% decline in the number of people donating blood at the beginning of the pandemic and continues to confront relentless issues due to the pandemic, including blood drive cancellations and staffing limitations. We faced a national blood crisis, our worst blood shortage in over a decade, posing a concerning risk to patient care. Amid the crisis, doctors were forced to make very difficult decisions about who received blood transfusions, who needed to wait until more blood products became available. Blood and platelet donations are critically needed to help prevent further delays in vital medical treatments. Amidst that crisis, a patient who had to visit the hospital for a transfusion was told the, the hospital had no blood that matched her blood type. She'd have to wait until the right match became available. Her condition worsened and she needed to be hospitalized as she waited for blood. We have about 10 million residents in our region, less than 3% currently give. Some may be unable to due to health conditions and other FDA restrictions, but this is where we could use help in closing the gap. So others don't need to wait the way that that patient did. Why is a diverse blood supply important? Blood types are inherited. They're determined by antigens. There are over 600 known antigens, some unique to racial or ethnic groups. Well-matched blood can decrease the risk of complications related to transfusion therapy, especially in patients who receive lifelong transfusions. And it's critical to increase the number of available blood donors from all racial and ethnic groups. 4.5 million Americans receive a transfusion each year. Let me repeat that, 4.5 million Americans receive a transfusion each year. They're needed for many reasons. To name a few, serious injuries, traumas, 
pregnant mothers experiencing labor difficulties, cancer fighters, premature babies. We're in close collaboration with the FDA about blood donor eligibility. As guidance continues to evolve, we are grateful to offer an inclusive blood donation process that treats all potential donors with equality and respect to ensure a safe, sufficient blood supply is readily available for patients in need. In addition to blood donors, the Red Cross needs the help of our volunteers to support critical blood collections across the country. Blood drive volunteers play an important role by greeting, registering, answering questions, and providing information of blood donors throughout the donation process. Blood transportation specialists, another volunteer opportunity, provide a critical link between blood donors and blood recipients by delivering blood to hospitals in communities across the country. There are so many ways to support. Simply visit redcrossblood.org or download our blood app to make a blood donation and to learn more. To continue the conversation about diversifying the blood supply, I'd like to introduce you to Jenny Gasparra. Jenny joined the American Red Cross in 2007 in disaster response and started in biomedical services in 2020. She convenes others in thought and action to address health inequities as the internal project lead for the Sickle Cell Initiative. Most of her career was leading corporate and foundation fundraising efforts in Colorado by convening partners to support the local and global work of the Red Cross. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much, Justin. And I'm just thrilled to be with everyone today. Um, so I'm a, my role is as product development and implementation director on our Red Blood Cell product team. Um, and as product professionals, you know, we're, uh, you may be familiar, it really came from the tech industry. Our whole goal is to know what are the needs of our hospital customers and especially the patients they serve. Uh, and so really, I'm thrilled to hear, to talk here to speak with you all today on sickle cell disease. Um, and what is that need of patients with sickle cell? How do we need to be even better as an organization to meet that need? So what is sickle cell disease? So sickle cell disease, it's the leading genetic um, blood disease in the US. Over 100,000 people, largely African-Americans are impacted by sickle cell disease. Um, for as a genetic blood disease, for someone to have sickle cell, um, it requires both parents to have sickle cell traits. If you have a sickle cell trait, you have a one in four chance of having a child with sickle cell disease. The really important and interesting thing about sickle cell trait is that there's a correlation with areas of the world that are endemic to malaria. Um, and those who have sickle cell trait have some protection against malaria. It's important to know that anyone of any racial or ethnic background can have sickle cell traits and have a child with sickle cell disease. Um, but here in the US, you know, primarily those of African descent, um, you know, where we know malaria is endemic within um, Africa, Southeast Asia, parts of Latin America, here in the U.S., it primarily impacts the African-American community. And there is no widely available cure for patients with sickle cell disease. And so frequent blood transfusions are critical. Those normally kind of oval-shaped red blood cells that carry oxygen to organs across your body, um, those who have sickle cell, that red blood cell is shaped like a crescent moon or that sickle shape. Um, and doesn't bring that oxygen to areas of your body. So frequent blood transfusions replenish that ability for oxygen to get across um, your body. I think it's really interesting and, and critically important for us to know um, that this disease is extremely painful. Um, patients with sickle cell who are going through a crisis can experience symptoms of extreme pain, anemia, tissue and organ damage, bone damage, and also strokes. And so frequent blood transfusions are critical. And a lot of patients with sickle cell disease um, have scheduled, regularly scheduled blood transfusions requiring up to 10 units of blood every single month. The next um, slide, Justin spoke about it a little bit here, but just the importance of a diverse blood supply. Um, blood donors are critical, um, especially for patients. When patients and those with sickle cell disease are receiving frequent blood transfusions, it's more, even more important, not only to match for blood type, so ABO, positive or negative, but beyond blood type to antigens. Um, 
And so having that match beyond blood type, um, we know that one in three donors who are African-American are a match for patients with sickle cell disease. So what are, what are we trying to do? Kind of how do we better meet patient need? What is our objective? Our objective is to increase our inventory of those units that are most compatible, those units beyond blood type that are most compatible for patients with sickle cell disease. Because when we don't have those compatible units, that can make it even harder to find a unit for that patient the next time. Um, patients with sickle cell disease, if they don't have a most closely matched unit, they can have alloimmunization, which is an allergic reaction to a blood donation. They can also form antibodies, um, making it even more important or even more difficult to find that match for blood type. And so our whole goal is to increase our African-American donor base. Um, as we know, one in three donors for African-American are a match for patients with sickle cell. And so having an increased inventory, um, so our hospital customers and patients with sickle cell have that most fully matched unit of blood and don't have to wait for that right unit of blood um, so that we have that available for patients. Um, some of our just key strategies within the initiative. So the, the next slide here shows um, on the left, those boxes in the right, there was a study done in 2019, and it's um, called a strategic planning tool for increasing African-American blood donor recruitment. Um, and within the Red Cross, you know, I um, and on, am on our project product side, um, and within our sickle cell initiative, I work with over 20 other work streams. Um, we have expertise in everything from donor recruitment professionals to collection professionals to our medical office and work with so many others on how do we address this need and how do we be different and do different as an organization so that we're meeting customer need, hospital customer need, and ultimately patient need. Um, we know there's a lot of kind of core tenants and pillars to what this work looks like. And those boxes on the left-hand side are some of those pillars, um, you know, based on this and other studies and just other knowledge, kind of intuition that we know. We know trust is critically important, especially within the Black community. Everything from things like the Tuskegee experiments to the continued health inequity that we see. Um, how is the Red Cross addressing this? Really, we build trust. Um, one conversation at a time. We have a national partnerships team that is partnering and building, deepening relationships with everything from HBCUs to Divine Nine um, to NAACP civic and community organizations like Jack and Jill, the Lynx, um, to churches and organizations. We also know awareness is critically important. You know, anyone can receive blood from anyone. And so, um, you know, how do we tell that story and what does that look like to convey that need for patients with sickle cell um, disease? We often do this through our national marketing campaign. We partnered with an organization, Burrell Communications, that's a preeminent African-American marketing agency. Um, Black History Month, for example, there's a, um, a, a great comedian, Ms. Charlene, that we've partnered with to bring awareness. Um, other influencers, other specific um, venues like Watch the Yard, um, we're trying to really be different and how can the Red Cross be in front of different audiences to share this need and specifically spread the word within the Black community. It's part of what we can do as an organization to be different and do different. Um, we know that the convenience of blood giving, we've done a, a tremendous amount of research in partnership with Morning Consult and Burrell Communication to know what's important for blood donors um, within the Black community. And we know convenience is one of those. So how do we have that local activation, especially in areas of the country where we have a higher percentage of households that are African-American? How do we use data to inform this work? Um, we also have some business development positions across the country, sickle cell account managers that have an expertise in engaging with a Black community and building those relationships um, across local communities education, you know, that why are donations needed? Um, and then altruism, partnering with incredible sickle cell warriors of telling that personal and lived experience, learning from them um, and showcasing that need is a critical component within our work. And then lastly, on the next slide here, we have a couple of different um, 
just highlights that we wanted to share based on the most completed calendar year of 2022. Um, through the investments and concerted focus and really the Red Cross looking at how can we be different and do differently to meet patient needs, um, we're thrilled that we've had a 22% increase in donors who are African American and a 24% increase in CEK neg donors. Those are sickle cell donors. That's the most common antigen needed for patients with sickle cell disease. We've had nearly a 50% increase in donors who are African American. Um, part of that work with national partnerships, um, we have an incredible new program in the HBCU Ambassador Program, a scholarship and leadership development program um, with our historically Black colleges and universities. So we have 27 different HBCU ambassadors who are activating on-campus blood drives and building that awareness and setting up blood drives on campus. Um, we have memorandums of understanding that are signed with members of the Divine Nine. The Divine Nine and the National Pan Panhellenic Council is that oversight and governing body of the historic nine Greek Black fraternities and sororities. Um, and then, as I mentioned, our sickle cell account managers. We have experts um, as part of our donor recruitment teams, really building those new relationships in those areas of the country where we have great growth opportunities. And this just showcases, you know, that shift in mentality of how do we activate and leverage communities, especially within key times of year, um, and also how do we engage segmented and targeted marketing. Um, so February, we're thrilled within Black History Month, Black Excellence um, is in our blood, is a theme of Black History Month within the American Red Cross with a, a lot of different activations with our national partners. Um, in April, we celebrate National Minority Health Month um, and Black Maternal Health Week within April. Um, June, Dr. Charles R. Drew, as Justin shared more information, um, his birthday is in June, as is World Sickle Cell Day, which falls on Juneteenth. And September, we know, um, is Sickle Cell Awareness Month, and we have a Joined by Blood uh, themed activation in September and October. And lastly, you know, reinforcing what Justin shared, you know, what is that call to service? How can each of you be involved? Um, I recommend everyone go to redcrossblood.org slash partner. Um, you'll put in just some basic information and you'll get access to a toolkit on how can we all build awareness on that need from blood donations, especially within the red, um, within the black community and what are Red Cross resources um, to support blood donations. As you can see, there is a lot of great work being done, but we still have a lot of work to, to be had to meet patient need and help those with sickle cell disease. But I just want to thank all of you for your generosity in rolling up a sleeve to donate blood and platelets and by spreading the word to get your company involved, especially if there's an African-American employee resource group, because um, that's what it's going to take all of us to help meet this need to ensure those who have sickle cell disease live longer and healthier lives. And with that, it's my honor to introduce you today, our Mission Moment speaker, Nicole Jordan. Nicole is the former Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Community Affairs at Via Transportation. Um, she is an active volunteer and leader of several nonprofits, um, but we're thrilled that Nicole not only is a volunteer for the American Red Cross as a member of the Red Cross Bay Area Chapter Board of Directors, um, but she's a Tiffany Circle member, um, leading not only with her time, but her financial resources. Um, and she spends her time volunteering as a member of our Biomed Committee and has a specific passion for our sickle cell work that we'll hear today. Um, other things that make Nicole great, um, she's passionate about mentoring women of color and has served as an executive mentor for Sequoia Capital's Ascent Mentoring Program, which is designed to support emerging women leaders in tech. So please help me welcome Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, um, Hannah, and Justin. Every time I speak with all of you, I feel like I learn just a little bit more about um, what the American Red Cross is doing, and it makes me even more proud to be a board member. Um, I'm here to share the story of why I joined the board, and specifically the story about my older brother. His name was Maurice Edon Jordan, and he, we go by Edon. That's his nickname. 
Um, this is a very cute photograph of us as children. Um, when I when I posted that he was my first best friend, we were extremely close. We were three years apart, and it's because my father was in the military and we moved around quite a bit. My mother had some issues with substance abuse, so we were constantly moving from house to house to the point where I went to seven different elementary schools, two middle schools, and two high schools. And so he was the constant um, in my life in terms of who was around and who was in my house and who was kind of like my leader whenever we had to do anything. So just to share a little bit about the life of, of someone who's suffering from sickle cell, I learned about sickle cell because he had it. And um, it manifested itself in a way that um, like he, he fainted in school one day and they were like, we're not sure why he fainted because again, people weren't really talking about sickle cell as a disease and didn't really know how to treat it. And then we went to camp one year. My great grandmother signed us up for a Christian camp and then he got very, very sick at high altitudes. So when we did a hike, he had to be basically carted down and taken down in a vehicle because he was in severe pain. And I think that both Jenny and Justin mentioned some of the symptoms of sickle cell and that you do have your blood cells kind of sickle or they're in a different shape, but it does cause extreme pain. And you don't have a warning of when it's going to happen. It just happens very um, at a point where you're just not recognizing that it's going to happen. So we would make plans and there were often times where we had to take him to the hospital or just help him deal with the pain. Um, he also joined the military out of high school. We were extremely proud of him for joining the Navy. And it's funny because they do a lot of tests when you join the military and it wasn't until nine years that he was in that they found out he had sickle cell and they're like, wait, you're not supposed to be in the military. <laughs> so they gave him an honorable discharge and it happened because again, he was on duty and he fainted and they were like, what's wrong? So um, they did a test and found out about sickle cell in his blood and gave him an honorable discharge. And this photo here is me and both of my brothers. My younger brother, Micah, is to my right and my older brother, Idan, is to my left. You can see he was just always pretty frail. Um, so that was just living with sickle cell and dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And everything culminated in um, 2019. I was in Los Angeles because that's where our family is from. And our grandmother was ill. And I told my brother who was living in Illinois at the time, I'm like, Idan, you got to get to LA because grandma's not doing well. And I remember picking him up from the airport and he arrived the afternoon that she passed. I'm the one who discovered that she passed away, sadly, and had to call hospice. And so I even let him know, I'm like, man, she passed away this morning. And so when we picked him up from the airport, he looked very frail and we just thought he was just sad and very upset about, you know, missing, um, saying goodbye to my grandmother but he, he just wasn't physically well. And so within 24 hours, he went into an episode. We called it sickle cell episodes, but they can, I think everyone who has sickle cell probably calls it something. But he had an episode and we were just doing whatever we could to make him comfortable. And it was the worst I had seen him. And it got to the point where I was like, I think we need to go to the hospital. And sadly, my brother was not one of those people who wanted to, he didn't trust hospitals, I think because he had bad experiences as a youth. But when you talk about Jenny, the treatments and the transfusions and the different things that you could do, or Justin, I think you spoke about that. There are so many things he could have done to make his life a little bit more easier, but he did not want to go to the hospital. So we had to beg him to, he finally passed out. And I was in the ER and in the ambulance with him to the hospital and it was just all these different signs of things that happened we ended up in a room where my grandmother was in the same room we ended up at a hospital where my brother was born so I was like all these signs and things are adding up that are just it's just so telling that something's going to happen here and I just remember sitting in the ER with him all evening waiting on a blood transfusion and they they were like we got to get him some blood and hours went by and he was in excruciating pain they finally gave him something to quell the pain but we waited so long for blood and I just felt so helpless. You know, as a younger sister, I just wanted to take the pain away and just help in some way. And um, we ended up losing him that evening and we ended up having a joint funeral for my grandmother and my brother a few days later. So I will just never forget the fact that I was with both of them when they passed and just the fact that it made us happy that they were together and that they he was able, we were able to celebrate their lives together. But it was just one of the worst positions for me being in because I'm a fixer, I'm a businesswoman, I'm a boss. I feel like I can do everything. And I felt so helpless in that moment. And a few months later, my friend Cortese who's on the Bay Area um, American Red Cross. She was sunsetting and retiring from the board. And she talked to me and she was like, they have an opening on the American Red Cross board and I wonder if you'd be interested. 
So I had a meeting and I had no idea that there was a sickle cell initiative or that there is help for military families. And in my first meeting with Lillian Pham, who was the president of the board at the time, they started rattling off all these things. And it literally was an aha moment for me that I needed to get involved with the board in a way to increase awareness of sickle cell, to increase the number of African-American donors, and also just to feel like I could do something. I felt like this is my way to do something since I wasn't able to do anything that evening that we lost him. And every time I tell this story or every time um, I visit his gravesite, which you can see now, I think about the number of people that we can help at least um, live with the disease a little bit longer and have an easier life with it, a little bit more comfortable life with it, and just raise awareness that all of us can help, especially in the African-American community to donate blood. Um, I, I did meet with the board. We're planning on doing a memorial blood drive for him in October. His birthday is October 18th, and we were thinking the second Saturday of every October of doing a blood drive where I'm specifically trying to get, of course, all my African-American friends. Of course, if you're not African-American, we would love for you to donate as well, but this is targeted to our community to get them to come out in droves. And some of my friends have said, I just never thought to donate blood, and yes, we're going to show up. So I feel like this is my way of giving back and this is my way of doing something to honor him and his memory, but also to um, to help others that can that can benefit from these blood services. So I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> wow, well, thank you so much. To, oh, I kick it back to you, Hannah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your incredible story. Um, and shedding light on sickle cell disease, being such a good champion for the Red Cross, and thanks for for all that you do. Also, want to thank Justin and Jenny for for painting that picture and how vital these blood donations are to support the sickle cell initiative. Um, so, thank you to to all of our speakers. We do have some questions in the chat, so I'll go ahead and and moderate them and and get us going on it. Um, Jenny, the first question I'll, I'll pitch to you. Uh, what is the overall impact of the sickle cell initiative since its inception and why should donors and partners consider supporting this and becoming advocates? Yeah, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, you know, the, the overall impact, we're thrilled that in the first full year we had 60% increase of first time donors. Um, we've also increased the number of antigen negative units. Those are those CEK units, those sickle cell units. We've increased the number that we're providing to our hospital partners. You know, so when um, families like Nicole, Nicole, your beautiful story, thank you for sharing that. So families don't have to wait. So patients, sickle cell warriors don't have to wait for blood. Um, so ultimately, that's the impact that we're they're, we're working toward um, and we're waiting toward. Um, and really, you know, it's this is we're addressing issues of systemic racism. This is something no blood bank has ever done. The industry struggles with it. Um, we don't have a blood supply across this country that reflects that diversity. And especially knowing um, the black community and patients with sickle cell need blood. Um, it's going to take all of us of what can we do personally? How can we do different and be different? How can we build that awareness? Um, because extraordinary and big things like this don't happen um, unless all of us do our part. And so I definitely recommend everyone go to Red Plus, redcrossblood.org slash partner um, and find out more information about ways to get involved. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Justin, I'll direct this question to you. From a regional perspective in the greater Bay Area, how can people support sickle cell in particular? Are there sickle cell specific blood drives or resource groups to encourage participation and collaboration with? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Hannah. Um, you know, I've got multiple parts that I'm going to answer this one. And, and one, you know, we often say the number one reason people don't donate is they weren't asked. And so first off, just being an advocate and making that personal ask. And I'll say traditionally, we've really done ourselves a disservice. Uh, and Jenny alluded to that. We've always talked about the A's, the B's and the O's, the RH factor, positive or negative, And we've kind of stopped the conversation there. And we can't. We need to have ongoing dialogue specifically about the antigens, about ethnicity and about the need to diversify the blood supply and really just educate more folks so that um, really individuals get it and then ultimately make an appointment to come out and donate blood. And while we do have some specific blood drives um, that we'll call sickle cell blood drives, I, I don't want folks to be limited in that. 
um, really, you can go to redcrossblood.org and sign up for a convenient location. You know, I'll say the next reason people don't donate is it wasn't convenient. So if you can't make it across the bridge, donating a, at a specific sickle cell drive or one that's in your neighborhood, that's OK. We can find a, a convenient opportunity for you and encourage you to go to redcrossblood.org to sign up and just get out there and donate. Um, the last piece I'll say is we also have a sickle cell account manager and Jenny referenced those uh, in her presentation. Um, and, and we have a wonderful one right here in Northern California. Um, and Diane Perry is an individual that works closely to help educate folks and can connect with specific groups. So I'll throw it out there. If we want to go ahead and uh, if you have someone that you want to connect us with, feel free to reach out to me and I'd, I'd be happy to make that connection. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Nicole, the next question is for you. And again, thank you for sharing your, your powerful story. Um, how can we help keep the legacy of your brother going? And what's one takeaway you want to leave people with today? Um, well, one way to keep the legacy going is I'm going to, again, we're doing a blood drive in the Bay Area, and I think we're going to name it Any Don's Memory. And what I love for it to be, just because we're going to gather in the Bay Area, I have my from Los Angeles teed up and I want them to donate wherever they are. So that will be the day of Edon's memory if we um, that I plan to do to keep his um, name alive. And I've already spoken with the um, American Red Cross Bay Area team and they're like, this should be an annual event. So we're already geared up to make this an annual event to donate in honor of his name every year. But the big takeaway, I think it aligns to what Justin was saying. It doesn't have to take an event or it doesn't have to take a specific day. Um, for the blood drive, I think it's just to be eligible. One thing that I um, didn't mention in my story is the first time I tried to donate blood, I couldn't because my blood pressure was too high. So um, even in the process of donating and trying to get everyone geared up is something that I've had to be aware of is my own health and getting my blood pressure under control. And that's another thing that disproportionately impacts African-Americans. So make sure that your blood pressure is good. Make sure that you're healthy and then come and donate to any blood um, center near you. That, that's my takeaway. Awesome, thank you. Um, Justin, I'll direct this one to you. We've had a few calls to action for folks to donate blood, to host blood drives, to volunteer. What are the steps for that process? Yeah, so really redcrossblood.org is your one-stop shop, and that's whether it's to donate, to volunteer, um, even to, if you have, say, 35 to 50 of your best friends and you all want to set up a blood drive and donate together, hosting a blood drive can be found at redcrossblood.org. Um, and you'll have specific information there as far as site suitability. Um, and we would partner you up with an account manager just to make sure that the room is well lit, well ventilated, easy access to parking, access to running water, restrooms, uh, and, and all that fun stuff. So um, again, redcrossblood.org, your one-stop shop. All right, thank you. And Justin, I'm gonna keep you keep you busy here with another question. Um, if folks aren't eligible to donate blood, how can they help? Yeah, another good one. And I think we've talked about it and just about every one of us touched on it. Um, volunteering um, is, is a great way. And just being an advocate, making that personal ask. You know, 38% of the population is eligible to donate, so certainly not everybody can. And there are a number of different reasons. I mean, Nicole, uh, you know, such a powerful story, wanting to, to give back, wanting to save lives, but then was deferred. You know, it, it's, it's unfortunately not uncommon. So really, we want um, to just help spread that message that it is a privilege to be able to donate. Um, and encourage individuals, again, redcrossblood.org, but to check eligibility because eligibility guidelines change. Um, you know, even recent, as recent as, as October, we, we shifted um, some of the travel guidance surrounding CJD or mad cow disease and have updated the guidance. So it is constantly evolving, constantly changing, um, and we keep our updated eligibility on redcrossblood.org. Awesome, thank you. I'll take this next question and Jenny, if you want to add anything in terms of CEK units, feel free to jump in. How does the Red Cross ensure blood donations arrive to people in need? Um, and I'll just share, we have um, relationship managers with our local hospitals and we do a couple things. We do some routine deliveries. Hospitals know when they're doing surgeries, so they'll keep their the local blood bank at their hospital. So we'll do those, those regular um, deliveries, but there's also surgeries that gone bad or a big trauma and we do some stat orders. And that's again where a transportation specialist will help us drive the gift of life from the Red Cross to the hospitals. Um, so we've got really good relationships 
relationships with our hospitals to make sure we have blood when it's needed. Jenny, anything you want to add in terms of CEK units? Sure. Um, the, the cool part is we have, um, you know, one of the things that sets the Red Cross office apart is just our incredible medical expertise, our medical office, and our lab services. We have 45 immunohematology reference laboratories across the country, and so those orders for specific needs beyond blood type, um, our immunohematology reference laboratories fill those. Um, and they test and type our blood donors so that we know who's a match for that extended kind of blood type that's needed for patients with sickle cell. Um, so we have an incredible team across the country of committed individuals um, who look at those scheduled orders and then also those emergent needs to find. And another thing that sets the Red Cross apart is our national inventory management system. If we don't have it within a local supply, they can reach out to that entire network across the country to fill that need and meet that need. Awesome, thank you. And again, I want to thank all of our, our panelists today. I want to thank our audience for, for the great questions. As we get close to the end of our presentation, I just wanted to um, share a couple closing remarks. First, I'd like to give a, a big thank you to, to all of you, to those of you that help us save lives every single day. We're grateful whether you're new to the Red Cross or you've been involved with the Red Cross for decades and for your ongoing commitment to our mission to helping those in need. Thank you again for spending part of your day um, listening to our speakers. Hopefully you found this session valuable. We hope you walk away with, with, a, with a tangible item to, to take away. Hope you're inspired to donate blood, to host a blood drive, to sign up to volunteer, helping spread the word. Let your, your family members, your friends know about something that you learned today and about the importance of diversifying our blood supply. Um, if you have additional questions, please let us know. We'll be sending out uh, an email with the link of the recording and feel free to, to reply. We'd be happy to answer any additional questions. And our next speaker series is going to be in the spring, so keep an eye out for that invite. Once again, I want to thank you all for your continued support. Keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a recording for this session, along with a quick survey to gather your input. Thank you once again to our amazing speakers for a wonderful discussion and to everyone who joined us today. This now concludes today's session.